بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم قالو سبحانک لا علم لنا الا ما علمت انا انك انت العلیم الحکیم Today we will be starting the new subject related to nervous system particularly to the brain it's a neurosurgical concerns in relation to anesthesia in relation to intensive care also I will divide this lecture into two small lectures so that we should go very slowly Broadly, nervous system is divided into two portions. One is central nervous system, another is peripheral nervous system. In central nervous system, so it's a brain. In brain, it is a cerebrum, cerebellum. Then there is a brain stem. Brain stem consists of three portions. That is midbrain, pons, and medulla. Then spinal cord, and there are some scary sounding structures also in the brain. Those scary structures are diencephalon and basal ganglia. In diencephalon is included thalamus, epithalamus, hypothalamus, subthalamus. So there are different uh, portions of thalamus. Then basal ganglia, caudate nucleus, globus pallidus, putamen, clostrum, and amygdala. Now basic functional unit in central nervous system is a neuron. Neuron. What is a neuron? Neuron has got a body. It got some something which is bringing to the body is called dendrites, and something which is taking away from the neuron is called axon. Then there are synapses. In peripheral nervous system, these are called nerves. They they send their message or they function through the nerves. Now in peripheral nervous system, there are spinal nerves and cranial nerves. Now, in spinal nerves, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, 7, 8 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, and 5 sacral, and 1 coccyx. And cranial nerves, there are 12 pairs. And you should be knowing about all the nerves, how they are distributed, and particularly about the cranial nerves, also where they are originating from, and what are their functions. As some has got purely motor functions, some has got mixed functions also, so that's a, a separate topic. Now, cerebral circulation is another thing which you are supposed to know. So, blood supply to the brain is through the internal, through the carotid arteries and through the vertebral arteries. And, and carotid arteries, internal carotid arteries, there are two internal carotid arteries, two-thirds of the blood supply to the brain is through these internal carotids and one-third is through the vertebral arteries. Now there is these vessels when you go inside uh, near the brain stem, so then they divide into different vessels and they make a circle which is called circle of villus. And it looks like if you look at uh, from inferiorly from there it looks like uh, as if there is a spider sitting there there are two big eyes and like this, it's a horrible picture which if you take the photograph of that. So I could not put on the slides. So, so there are two vertebral arteries when they go and they join to form basilar arteries. Then the basilar artery immediately uh, divides into uh, that's called posterior cerebral arteries. And then two internal carotid arteries and then they uh, two vessels which is important which come out of the circle of villus is anterior cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery. And from the basilar artery which divides into post, uh, their, uh, cerebellar arteries which originate from the basilar arteries. From the upper end of the basilar artery where it divides into a posterior, uh, posterior cerebral artery so there is superior cerebellar artery that originates from there supplies the cerebellum. Then from the from where the basilar artery is formed, there are two vessels which are originated from there, which is very important, are called anterior inferior cerebellar artery and posterior inferior cerebellar artery. They, in addition to cerebellum, they also supply the uh, some nearby uh, uh, areas of the brain. Now the blood flow which is going into the brain is about 40 to 50 mL per 100 gram per minute. Now the weight of the brain is about 1.4 kilogram and 1400 gram. 
So for every 100 gram, it supplies 40 to 50 mils per minute. It's a large amount of blood supply. Then we look at the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen utilization. How much is oxygen utilized by the brain? Now, this is about three mils per 100 gram per minute. How it is calculated? You know the cerebral blood flow, you multiply it with arteriovenous difference of oxygen content. If you multiply it, it comes out to be 3 mils per 100 gram per minute. These calculations, these things you know, are very important because cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen and is very important parameter to look at because we want to see if there is a cerebral ischemia or not. So this is estimated also. Now, another terminology, critical cerebral blood flow. Any cerebral blood flow below 50% of the patients develop regional evidence of cerebral ischemia. If I correlate it with some of the anesthetic agents which are commonly used, isoflurane and fluorine, so, so the critical value is 10 mils per 100 gram per minute. In halothane, 18 to 20 mil per 100 gram per, per minute and end flow range 15 mil per 100 gram per minute. I'll explain it a little bit later on. Now venous drainage of, from the brain, there are superficial veins and there are deep veins. Deep veins, they drain into internal jugular vein, then spinal venous channels and vertebral venous channels. Otherwise, normally what happens is when there is arterial supply to any organ, there are venous drainage also along with the arteries. But in brain, it doesn't happen into that, in that way. In the brain, there are sinuses. Uh, sinuses are lying in the brain, and where the blood is collected, then from there, it is drained out. Nerve supply to the brain is sympathetic from the cervical sympathetic ganglion, and parasympathetic is from the facial nerve via greater superficial petrosal branch. So this is a nerve supply to the brain itself. Now, control of cerebral blood flow is very important when we are dealing with these patients who are coming for uh, CBA or the patient who had intracranial surgery or has got intracranial pathology. So, there are five regulations. One is metabolic regulation of blood flow because the blood flow should be 40 to 50 mils per 100 gram per minute. That should be kept constant. And there is a blood brain barrier also. Right. So, to Considering that, then we have to look how the cerebral blood flow is controlled by the body. Metabolic regulation, chemical regulation, autoregulation, neurogenic regulation. There are other factors like rheology of blood also. Now, in metabolic regulations, now, if you increase the nerve cell activity, it will increase the blood flow to the brain. It means there is a linear correlation between the nerve cell activity and the cerebral blood flow. If the brain cells becomes active, so that will automatically blood flow will be increased. So it's a very linear correlation with it. What happens, in what conditions this nerve cell activity is increased, commonly seen as epileptic seizures. If there is a pain, third is if the patient is anxious and worried about things, so their brain cell activity is increased, so blood flow is also accordingly increased. Now, painful stimuli in the post-operative period is very important. Never ever give painful stimuli to the patients who have got a brain insult. Sometimes what we do is we go and press the um, supraoptic nerve and we give painful stimuli to the patient uh, with, to see the response. It's very bad. It should not be done in a neurosurgical patient or any patient who has come with a CVA or something because it increases the brain activity, it increases the intracranial pressure. It makes a lot of difference if the intracranial pressure is already high. It, can, it might be reached to the point where when there is no compensation, it can tremendously increase and can cause brain ischemia and can damage to the brain. So painful stimuli, one should be very careful when we are giving, when you want to assess the uh, neurological uh, effect or the neurological Glasgow coma scale or something like that. Then you have to look at what is the effect of different drugs like particularly barbiturates and LCD is not nowadays used and barbiturates is very important uh, nowadays propofol is used. 
Then auto regulation. Out of all the regulation, auto regulation is very important. Mean arterial pressure at which the regulation is controlled, blood flow regulation control to the brain is 60 to 130 millimeter of mercury. If the mean arterial pressure goes below 60 millimeter of mercury, then auto regulation fails. If it goes above 130, then auto regulation fails. You can see the correlation on the graph like this. So you've got a perfusion pressure on the one side, that's the mean arterial pressure. On the other side, cerebral blood flow. It will lowest on this side and then it goes increase and remains stable between 30 to 60 to 130 millimeter mercury. If you increase more than 130, it tremendously increases cerebral blood flow. It will cause brain edema, it will increase ICP and it will damage the brain. If the brain is already damaged, it will increase the damage to, to the brain. So, mean arterial pressure is nothing, as you already know from our previous lectures, diastolic pressure plus one third of pulse pressure. What is a pulse pressure? It is a difference of systolic blood pressure and diastolic pressure. You take the difference, divide it by three, add to the diastolic pressure, that will be your mean arterial pressure. Otherwise, your monitor is already doing automatically. They will tell you, but you should be able to calculate yourself also. Now, it's important thing is, all these things which are brain, they are causing pressure, which is called intracranial pressure. If you take this pressure from the mean arterial pressure, that is called cerebral perfusion pressure, at which the brain is being perfused. See, cerebral perfusion pressure is very important figure, one very important parameter to look at when you are dealing with a patient who has got neurosurgical or neurological uh, problem or pathology. Because this ICB should be. Now, I have just mentioned a few words about ICB. It's a separate topic. Intracranial pressure is the interaction between the intracranial contents and cranium. You got a thick skull. In, in the skull, what is lying? You have got brain in it, CSF in it, and blood. It's the arterial blood and the venous blood. There's no other things. So these, all these things under the closed cavity of cranium, so they have got interaction that creates a pressure which is called intracranial pressure, ICP. Now if you take this ICP from the mean arterial pressure, that is cerebral perfusion pressure, CPP. Now this normally the brain size, depending on the person's head, is around about 1400 gram in average person. CSF at, at, at one point time there is 75 mils and blood is normally 75 mil in present. So if there is increase of one thing, if there is in, you increase the blood quantity inside the brain, so it will squeeze out the CSF. Then the other portion, other, other part will, be, uh, will try to compensate it. But Normal ICP, intracranial pressure, is about 10 to 15 millimeter mercury. Some people write 10 to 20 millimeter mercury. This is normal. If it goes above that, then we'll have to find out what is the cause. It's very easy to measure it. As we are putting arterial line and connected, and you put small hole there, and there is extra, extra dural, subdural, and subarachnoid places where you can put the catheter in, and then you measure and display on the we have got the provision in our monitors, so we can do it, but we are not routinely doing it. So it gives you a lot of information. If the ICP is increased, we will have to take the step to lower the ICP. Autoregulation, still on autoregulation, mechanism is intrinsic response of arterial smooth muscle to intraluminal pressure. If the pressure is increased, so body tries to compensate the blood flow to the brain. The, this is called, there will be, if you increase the blood flow to the brain, so it will breach the uh, total amount of blood which is going into the brain, so the vessel try to constrict and try to regulate it. This is called autoregulation, but this happens only between 60 millimeter of mercury and 130 millimeter of mercury or mean arterial pressure. Then low limit shifts to the right in hypertensive patient. We say when the patient comes with an intracranial uh, problem that autoregulation should not be 
disturbed. One thing, when the patient is suffering from hypertension, if you look at this graph of this autoregulation, it shift, shifts towards the right. It means the brain perfusion is used to uh, the low limit is increased. For example, low limit is 60 millimeter mercury of mean arterial pressure. So it might be used to 80 millimeter mercury of mean arterial pressure low limit. Now, if you drop the pressure, mean arterial pressure below the 80 in those patients, then the patient will have brain ischemia. Because it is brain is used to high blood pressure, so its whole graph has been shifted towards the right. Same way with the upper limit also. So upper limit is 130 millimeter mercury of mean arterial pressure. Autoregulation used to that. In a hypertensive patient, it has moved towards the right. So it might be used to uh, not 130, 140, 150, 160. So if you drop that, then uh, if you increase that, I mean more than that, then it will breach the autoregulation. So the most important is the lower limit of blood, uh, mean arterial pressure, at which the brain is used to have a cerebral blood flow. So this is very important. So it means any patient who is coming for surgery, for intercranial surgery, you must control their blood pressure at least five to six days before we can bring down the autoregulation to its original level, to 60 to 130 millimeter mercury. And it's a true about any uh, patient who is going to have an aesthetic agent and patient is hypertensive, patient is diabetic. What is the idea of controlling blood pressure? We can, all the drugs and anesthetic which we are using, they, they lower the blood pressure except one or two. So, so we can always control the blood pressure during, during uh, surgery. But the point is all the organs of body, particularly your brain, your heart, your liver, and your kidney, they are used to higher mean arterial pressure. Now, if you drop the blood pressure during anesthesia, so they will uh, disturb their autoregulation and the organs will suffer ischemia. And that, because of that ischemia, it can damage the organ cells also. And most important thing about anesthesia is the patient who comes for anesthetic, in whatsoever condition the patient is in, in relation to every organ in the body, they should go in the same condition back because you don't know how many neurons you have damaged during your anesthetic drug, which is not evident immediately in post-operative period. Might come after five years. Okay, my yadda chali gaya, yadda se kamzor ho gaya. Uske neuron jo aapne nasizhe diya teen, chaar saal pehle, that has damaged the brain, now it is appearing. So whole thing is the quality, quality of anesthesia. In a hypertensive patient, you must control the blood pressure so that the uh, perfusion pressure should be normalized particularly in the brain, heart, and liver, and kidney. If you can wait to have the period to control the blood pressure, koi jaldi na usme kare. Kya hai, jir latayin hum to blood pressure anesthesia ke dhuran bhi kam kar sakte hai. We are not worried about high blood pressure. We are not worried about, about a low pressure because it will go beyond the limits of autoregulation. Right. So, but... Uh, it becomes ineffective, uh, this uh, autoregulation, like in diseases, trauma, or direct vasodilators when you're using. When you're using direct vasodilators, for example, you are, are using isocate and other things also, they got hydralazine, direct vasodilator, it will breach the autoregulation. It can uh, disturb your autoregulation. Now, chemical regulation. Chemical regulation, it means regulation of cerebral blood flow to the brain extracellular pH, whether it is acidity or alkalinity. And pH is related to carbon dioxide and, and oxygen. Now, if you increase the carbon dioxide level from normal one millimeter of mercury, it will increase a 4% cerebral blood flow. How much effect is that got? For example, if the patient has got 40 millimeter mercury and the next patient has got um, 50 millimeter of mercury PCO2 and you are anesthetizing for intracranial surgery, it will increase the cerebral blood flow 4% for every millimeter mercury rise. If there is 10 millimeter mercury rise, it will be 40%. And it can increase the intracranial pressure. 
it can damage the brain. So this is a correlation. And if the CO2 goes up to 80 millimeter mercury, the cerebral arterioles are maximally dilated and cerebral blood flow is doubled. Right? So keep this thing in your mind when you are dealing with such patients and their CO2 is high. Carbon dioxide below 20 milliliter mercury, it will reduce the cerebral blood flow because if there is hypocarbia, it will cause severe vasoconstriction and that will reduce the blood flow to the brain also. If you go up to 20 millimeter mercury, it can decrease 40 percent of the blood flow to the brain. That will cause ischemia also. So that's why when we uh, put these patients on ventilator, we try to keep the PCO2 between 30 to 35. Uh, maximally, we can go down to 25. Never ever go below 25 millimeter mercury. Because if you go below that, then it will cause cerebral vasoconstriction. It will reduce the blood flow to the brain. Now, if you go beyond uh, above 40%, 40 millimeter mercury, then it will increase the blood flow to the brain also. So the ideal is you keep between 25 to 35. Some people say between 30 to 35 millimeter mercury, it should have a slight vasoconstriction. It should restrict the cerebral blood flow and it should try to reduce the intracranial pressure. So that's the, that's the ideal millimeter mercury, PCO2. Oxygen. Oxygen does not have an effect on the pH under unless it is brought to 50 millimeter mercury or 6.6 kilopascals. Now, below that, it will cause vasodilatation. When it will increase, cause vasodilatation, it will increase the cerebral blood flow. If you are giving 100% oxygen to the patient who is on ventilator, has got intracranial problem, so it will reduce 10% of cerebral blood flow. So you, when you are giving to your resuscitating patient, you have put the patient on a ventilator and you have got no choice but to give 100% oxygen to the patient. So you should always keep in your mind that is causing cerebral vasoconstriction, 100% oxygen and to reduce the cerebral blood flow by 10%. Now, if you are giving oxygen at high atmospheric pressure, for example, you are giving at two atmospheric pressure, it will dec decrease the cerebral blood flow, double amount then at one atmosphere pressure, that's about 20%. These chemical regulation figures are very important when you are dealing with these patients during your aesthetic or in the ICU also when you are ventilating these patients. Then neurogenic control. Now, if you stimulate sympathetic system, obviously it will cause vasoconstriction. When it will cause vasoconstriction, it will reduce the blood flow. Now, if you are using parasymp if you are stimulating the parasympathetic system, it will cause vasodilatation. It will increase the blood flow to the brain. If your autoregulation has been breached, if your autoregulation is intact, it will try to maintain the cerebral blood flow between 60 millimeter mercury and 130 millimeter of mercury mean arterial pressure. So, but it does not make difference more than 10% stimulating a sympathetic or parasympathetic system. Other factors, blood rheology. I mean, how thick is the blood? Hemoconcentration. Greater the hemoconcentration, less will be blood flow to the brain. So the overall effect will be less blood going to the brain, less oxygen going to the brain. If the temperature is high, it will increase. It will cause vasodilatation. It will increase the blood flow. Then Anesthetic agents, variable anesthetic, if you are giving intravenous anesthetic agent or you are giving inhalation anesthetic agent, then there are two groups like this. For example, we have divided the anesthetic agent into three groups. Group one, group one which lowers the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen and lowers the cerebral blood flow. These are all intravenous anesthetic agent except ketamine. Right? All intravenous anesthetic agents, they lower the cerebral blood flow, decrease the cerebral blood flow, and then decrease the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen utilization, which is 3 mL per 100, 100 gram per minute. Right. The group 2, it lower the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, but increase the cerebral blood flow. All volatile, volatile anesthetic agents, like halothane, endofluorine, isoflurane, and 
sebo fluorine all these under inhalation under static agent they suppress the neuronal activity so they lower the oxygen requirement but they cause vasodilatation also so they will increase the cerebral blood flow so this is general rule uh, except n fluorine n fluorine increases the cerebral activity also neuronal activity also so one exception in intravenous anesthetic agent one exception in in inhalation anesthetic agent then group 3 is which increases cmro2 also increases the cerebral blood flow the same two exceptions come over here ketamine out of intravenous anesthetic agent and n fluorine out of inhalation anesthetic agent so this is the basic rule one should remember any anesthetist who is going to anesthetize the patient for neurosurgical intervention now same thing repetition inhalation anesthetic agent they all lower the cmr2 increase the cerebral blood flow so increase the icp except n fluorine because n fluorine will increase the cmr2 also then all the intravenous anesthetic agent they decrease the cmr2 decrease the cerebral blood flow decrease the icp except ketamine ketamine stimulates the brain and increase the blood flow also so so these are two exception there now if i take individual anesthetic agents like that nitrous oxide it lowers the cmro2 increases the cerebral blood flow and so it tends to cause increase in uh, icp intracranial pressure halothene same way lowers the cerebral, cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen utilization then increases the cerebral blood flow increases icp and fluorine increases all three this increases the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen utilization increases the cerebral blood flow increases the icp isofluorine lowers the cmro2 increases the cerebral blood flow increases the icp so these are the basic general principles of anesthesia when you are dealing with a patient for neurosurgical anesthesia now there are two terminology one is cerebral steel and other is inverse steel padhiye kabhi hai haan ji so this is very important if you look at these two uh, portions you have got a normal brain this is a normal brain and this is a dead brain or where there is an infarction or where there is a tumor lying or where there is a bleeding the brain so those two portion if you if the blood is drawn into the normal brain it is called steel phenomena ye chori kar raha hai blood disease se theek when it goes from normal brain to diseased brain or damaged portion of the brain and it is called inverse steel ulta usme dal raha hai all the intravenous anesthetic agent for example barbiturates they have inverse steel phenomena because they will cause in a normal brain they will cause vasoconstriction from there the blood will be going to the diseased part those vessels are paralyzed in the disease part so they cannot be responding to these intravenous anesthetic agent so the blood from the normal brain starts going into the disease brain a uh, damaged brain and that becomes a big that will increase the icp but inhalation anesthetic agent they cause dilatation of the vessels in the normal brain so the blood starts coming from the disease part of the brain to the normal brain so he is still in the blood into the normal side that's good thing that's a better thing so always keep in mind what is a steel phenomena versus what is inverse steel phenomena this is both of the people get confused with it make yourself clear or what is the mechanism they should know intravenous anesthetic agent mechanism why it causes um, uh, inverse steel and the other one why it causes a steel effect it is same way as people um, get confused with barrier nursing or reverse barrier nursing usme bhi confusion ho jati hai so this is very important this is a very important question i think in neurosurgical anesthesia if the examiner doesn't ask you this question it means he has a missed big thing it should be asked in oral examination now this is about barbiturates now intravenous uh, like barbiturates it has if you are using in are we using barbiturates now it is still two indication in my opinion it is uh, anesthetic agent should be used one is in the uh, 
for cesarean section, and the second is for the neurosurgical anesthesia. These are beautiful drugs. In a, if you're giving in a sedative dose, small dose, so it should, it should, it does not affect much on the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, but the cerebral blood flow also remains normal. It does not affect it. When you are giving in a higher dose, it lowers the CMRO2, it lowers the cerebral blood flow, it lowers the ICP, and it will cause inverse steel phenomena, right? So, uh, propofol, which is very commonly used, it increases the vasoconstriction, and it lowers the CMRO2, decreases the EEG, suppresses the EEG, lowers the cerebral blood flow, and lowers the ICP. It's a beautiful drug, can be used. But some people say it can increase the metabol it can increase the neuronal activity also. But it depends how much dose you are giving. Ketamine is it is a causes cerebral vasodilatation, it increases CMRO2, it increases the integrating pressure, and it lowers the CPP, cerebral perfusion pressure. Because if it increases the ICP and the this uh, cerebral perfusion pressure is nothing, mean arterial pressure minus ICP. So that will be reduced. It means it will be, it will give less time for the perfusion of the brain. That's a dangerous thing to do. So whenever we look at the ICP, we always look at the mean arterial pressure. Never ever try to lower the blood pressure before you try to lower the ICP. First, take the steps to lower the ICP, then take the step to lower the blood pressure. If you drop the blood pressure before lowering the ICP, you will reduce the cerebral perfusion pressure and you will call more ischemia to the brain, more damage to the brain. Now, narcotic analgesic and neuroleptics. Now, if the PCO2 is kept normal, if you keep the PCO2 normal, morphine and pethidine, they lower the, all the narcotics, you know, lower the CMRO2 and they lower the cerebral blood flow, so they will lower the ICP. Fentanyl, very common use and very potent analgesic, right? So, because if you look at the uh, opi uh, derivatives, like your catapathidine, then morphine, then agejale, fentanyl, so fentanyl, Remifentanil, right? So, if, you, if they, this is got a rule of 10, everything increases by 10 percent. Uh, 10, 10 times, potency increases 10 times, not 10 percent. Now, propofol lowers the CMR of is normal, cerebral blood pressure is lowered. Fentanyl plus droperidol, if you combine, droperidol is butrophenone. A group, it belongs to that group we used to use as an intervention anesthetic agent. It's a beautiful drug and neuroleptic anesthesia also get it also. Obviously, this is haloperidol. So, this is droperidol and haloperidol. Droperidol was used for an anesthetic agent. Haloperidol is serine is get it Something like that, yeah. So, they lower the CMRO2, they lower the cerebral blood flow, they lower the ICP, intracranial pressure. This is about muscle relaxation also. And some of the old drugs are lying there, like tubocrarine, nobody uses it. It lowers the ICP and lowers the cerebral perfusion pressure. Saxamethonia, which we are commonly using, commonly using for uh, emergency intubation, other patient uh, for coming for cesarean section, uh, and for emergency purposes, you always use saxamethonium because it is short acting, deep polarizing agent. So. It, but always remember, it causes fasciculation also. It also increases the intracranial pressure. So never ever uh, routinely use this uh, uh, saxamethonium in your neurosurgical anesthesia. So pancaronium, uh, vacaronium, and other drugs are also, it has got insignificant significant effect. Then flexidil was old drug which was used. Atracurium, which is commonly used now, cis atracurium and atracurium. It increases the intracranial pressure. And it is a beautiful muscle relaxant. It also increases the cerebral excitation. But say cis atracurium does less uh, stimulation of the brain cell as compared to atracurium. But if you are given sedative agent or intervenous and sedative agent in a good dose, it doesn't make much difference. Now, in neurosurgical anesthesia, there are three problems we always keep in our mind. One is 
cerebral blood flow, and other is cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen utilization, and third is intracranial pressure. Now, in cerebral blood flow, it is increased if you use vasodilated drugs or you increase the blood pressure because of any reason. So two things we have to keep in mind in relation to cerebral blood flow. Increase in cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen utilization entirely depends on neuronal activity. If you don't take a step to suppress the neuronal activity, it will increase the oxygen requirement of the brain cell. Obviously, we'll suppress the neuronal activity by giving intravenous anesthetic agent. So then we are dealing with it. But if you let the patient have a severe pain, and if you give him such a drugs which are stimulating the brain cells, it is going to increase the CMRO2. But if you fail to supply the oxygen to the brain as required by the brain cell, then the brain cells will suffer and hypoxia, there will be anaerobic metabolism, there will be uh, uh, lactate production. That will cause vasoparalysis, that will increase intracranial pressure. Then ICB. ICB is increased if you increase the tissue fluid in the brain. And secondly, if you increase the venous con congestion. Don't try to give too much fluid to these patients. And secondly, always keep the head up and keep the head straight. If you bend the head like this, so this side jugular vein will be compressed and that will decrease the venous drainage from the part of brain and the IC will increase. So you must have noticed in the uh, uh, ICU also, I always first of all look at the patient, what is the position? I always say the position is wrong. You raise the head and keep the head straight. If the patient has got CVA or the patient had any neurosurgical intervention, it should be straight so that there should be problem venous drainage and give gravitational effect also, lays the head of the patient, so that this venous congestion should not uh, have contribution towards the raising of intracranial pressure. On the one side is the arterial blood which is going into the brain, we try to control it, keep it arterium, other side we enhance the venous drainage. So the two steps you have already taken, third thing is you control the neuronal activity also. And the fourth thing is the blood, uh, water which has gone into the cells itself, take it out by giving a mannitol or osmotic diuretic also. And try to keep the patient in, uh, not uh, try to keep the patient in pain, try to reduce the pain as far as possible, rather the patient should be completely pain free. Now again, what are the problems of neurosurgical anesthesia? This is a straight question. Rather, I'm giving the, we are giving the answer also. Avoid vasodilatation, avoid hypercarbia, avoid hypoxia, avoid pain and anxiety, induce hypotension, then depress cerebral activity or avoid the drugs which increase the CMRO2. There is no other problem than these seven problems. So they always keep in your mind these seven problems when you are giving anesthesia or you are dealing with a patient who has got a neurosurgical problem or there is a problem in the brain. Now basic considerations, what is the condition for which you are giving anesthesia to the patient? Conditions requiring intracranial surgery, whether it is a uh, tumor or whether it is a hemorrhage or whether it is infected area. What is the problem there? You should know the original problem. Us problem, keep here problem, they can kya ho sakti anesthetic mein. Then intracranial space occupation, how big the area has been involved and how it is affecting the intracranial pressure. Then subarachnoid hemorrhage. Then pituitary surgery. They've got slight different from each other. Then cerebral arterial insufficiency. Then head injury. This type of the patient you will be dealing when you are asked to give neurosurgical anesthesia. So you should keep all these conditions in your mind and you look at all those seven problems in your mind before you start, before you start managing the patient for neurosurgical anesthesia. It's very simple. I love neurosurgical anesthesia myself. My neurosurgical anesthesia, neonatal surgery and cesarean sections or uh, obstetric surgery. So, so these are the things, very delicate surgery, three surgeries. A 
still I'm coming on the problem. Problems related to disordered physiology. Then problems related to cerebral effect of an aesthetic agent. Then problems related to technique of anesthesia. Then special requirement of neuroanesthesia itself. So if you can summarize your problem, you keep those problems and then these problems combine together. These are our guests. They always come during the lecture. At least pigeons are there to listen to lecture. Nurses are both busy, okay. So you keep in your mind this. There are problems related to disordered physiology because of pathology in the brain. Then problems related to cerebral effect of anesthetic agent. You are giving anesthetic agent to the patient, whether it is inhalation or intravenous. Problems related to technique of anesthesia. What type of anesthesia you are going to use? With neuroleptic anesthesia or any other routine anesthesia. Then special requirement of neuroanesthesia. So if you can organize yourself like this and some, they ask you in your exam, so then tell them on their face and they will never be able to ask you another further question. Right? Because then they immediately they will realize that you know the subject. And the subject is not complicated, it's very simple. But you should be very organized. In general problems, when we are giving neurosurgical anesthesia, general problem, problem is the tube. What type of tube you are using? What is the size of the tube you are using? And how would you intubate this patient also? These are the problems related to tube. These are not only general anesthetic. Then access to the head. Neurosurgeon will be standing there, and you are also standing there. How would you access to the head if you are required to use uh, uh, access the head during your surgery. So that should be also in your mind. Then patient's temperature because it is a quite a big area, brain is exposed and temperature is dropping. So you will have to consider that you should have steps to t monitor the temperature also. It's better to minute to minute temperature monitoring. Then blood loss. That also has to be kept in mind. Diathermy interference. You have got the monitors on and you have put the diathermy pads also. Whether diathermy pads are inter monitored on your screen or not, that's very important also. Then respiration, whether you are keeping the patient on spontaneous or control the ventilation. So then consciousness, in some of the surgeries, in neurosurgery, you might have to wake the patient up to see whether the surgery is successful or not. Yeah. So during the CF, you want to wake, wake up the patient and they want to see, which is now dehydration because we want to limit the intravenous fluid therapy to this, but we don't want to dehydrate the patient also. It should be adequate fluid therapy. Then pneumonitis. This patient has been unconscious or semi-conscious or they are according to chroma scale, whether they have aspirated or not, these things you have to exclude, whether they have ordered pneumonitis or not, so you will have to keep in your mind also and uh, you should have prepared if you don't have a time, but you should keep in your mind that you are going to look out in the post-operative period. Hypertension, as I told you, because hypertension you have to look at the mean artery pressure. Then the airway. You keep in your mind what is happening to airway after the operation also. So whether you are going to keep the tube in or whether you are going to have a tricosmy or is it okay to extubate the patient and keep on your oral breathing. Then post-op convulsions. You should start taking prophylactic steps for post-op convulsions if they are done any type of intracranial surgery. Right? These are the general problems. Then related to cerebral perfusion problem, arterial CO2 tension. That should be monitored intraoperatively, postoperatively. Hypertension and hypotension, venous pressure, drugs which you are using, and hypoxia. These are related to cerebral perfusion.